Well, welcome. Um, I'm very honored to be able to give this presentation on one of my favorite topics, um, trial design. Um, been involved in designing trials for the last uh, a decade, I could say. And um, it's a pleasure to have had the opportunity to collect literature, uh, look into the topic a little bit more in depth in preparation for this uh, for this presentation. I hope I'll uh, be able to entertain you. Um, I'll be talking, uh, as you saw on the title slide, about uh, trial design. And um, I'm first going to be reviewing different study designs that, it, that we could be using in the industry or are using. Then I'm going to talk about how to determine the size of an experiment. Um, I'm going to introduce two topics, signal versus noise, which have to do with how can we measure effects in experiments. And then uh, uh, some examples on field experimental design, field study designs. And I'll uh, close off with some uh, take home messages in uh, 28 minutes from now. Um, first, we have to uh, recognize two different types of studies. We have observational studies that are predominantly aimed at studying um, naturally occurring variation and effects. So in these studies we do not interfere, but we are, um, we're using the, the data that we generally, in many, many of the producers are already collecting, uh, to unravel relations. And uh, they can be used to diagnose issues, to diagnose diseases, think about screening on antibodies against low pathogenicity, even influenza. They can be used, uh, the red arrow should go up to case control studies. They can be used to diagnose, yeah, to, um, uh, to figure out what is the cause of a disease. Think about uh, uh, the, the, the Zika virus in Brazil. Yeah. A case control studies are the basis of identifying the virus as a cause. Then we have cohort studies. Those can be used to predict uh, the recovery from a disease or the recovery from a performance dip in production animals. So those are all observational. Then the experimental ones are specifically those studies in which we interfere. We introduce an intervention deliberately to study its effects. They are, in, in a way, they are a, a cohort study as well, with the only difference that we deliberately introduce the intervention here. But the fact, this, this is not the only difference, uh, sorry, the, the fact of deliberately introducing the intervention is not the only characteristics of a controlled experiment. Um, so this is a slide summarizing some of the other characteristic that make an experiment, a controlled experiment, a controlled experiment. So um, first of all, they are, as we all understand, they're aimed to study the effect of one or more interventions against the control treatment. That's where the word controlled is coming from. Uh, and they do so by trying to prove a hypothesis, uh, comparing it to the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis could be something in the sense of if I let go of this remote control, it won't drop. That's the null hypothesis. And in, in, in trials it would be, the treatments do not influence performance, if we talk about broilers, for example. Or if I vaccinate this, uh, these broilers, it won't affect disease occurrence. So we're trying to reject that. We're trying to prove that that conclusion is actually very unlikely to hold. So for that we need multiple independent experimental units and we need to allocate the treatments across these experimental units in a random fashion. And this is for two, um, so we can control or correct for or exclude all other known or unknown factors that might influence the, the, the measure 
that we are the, the effect that we're measuring the outcome that we are measuring so in that way we're sure that we're actually only measuring the effect of the intervention under study and by arranging experimental units in groups that are more similar than others um, we can uh, which is which is often done in, in, in our studies we can further reduce the variability and reduce a little bit of that variation thereby increasing the power of our, our controlled experiment so uh, uh, once uh, now a little bit about the importance of replication so here you see two density curves yeah these are clearly showing that there is, in this case, a difference between the two treatment groups. In reality, we, we would not know these curves, of course. So we do studies, we have, in this case, a small number of applications, three per treatment, and the dots represent the observed outcome, the, the observed performance. Um, so remember, we don't know what the curves are. Eh? The, um, these dots are, are, are in reality derived from the curves, so, so the experimental units are samples from that infinitely large study population that we draw from. That's why they talk about sample. It's a sample from the study population. So now we try to um, conclude by looking at the dots if this treatment is actually having an effect. And, well, we have six dots here to look at. So we, we might we will we'll gonna use statistics to see if it is likely that this effect is r real. However, if we would not replicate it, we would only have one pen or one broiler house versus one other. Still, we have dots. Those are samples of the same larger study population that you see here in these curves. And in the current example, they are two examples randomly chosen about how they could show up. And it's a density curve, so samples are more likely to end up around the center, because there the probability is higher. They could look like this, and the conclusions that you might make based on these two dots might actually be correct. But it's equally possible that they are looking like this and now you could conclude based on these two houses that you can easily uh, substitute one treatment one diet for the other and have the same performance so I was at the PSA in Orlando last month and there uh, Tom Frost um, was presenting uh, on research methodology, the whole, there was a whole afternoon on this topic, I was lucky. In preparation for this day, I could sit there and listen to all our colleagues in the industry um, presenting on this same topic. So, and uh, what, 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 what Tom Frost, he introduced the pair housed trial monster. And he did it in a funny but a very serious way. He said, and I agree with what he said, we're, we're taking care of this monster, we're feeding it, and it's doing fine. But it's a monster for a reason, right? We might, we, um, although it is, it's a practice that is done uh, often in the industry, and it is, you know, it's an attractive, it sounds to some people as an good way of, com of, of evaluating interventions, tr additives, treatments, it, in reality it isn't. Um, but it can be very, it can seem very attractive. You have a farm with two identical houses, uh, the same birds, the same size of the house, the same stocking density, and um, it, it, it seems very attractive to, to study uh, diets or interventions in such conditions. So, but I learned, uh, six, I think it was six years ago, from an uh, experienced Spanish nutritionist, and he told me a story about a manager 
requesting him to do such a study. They had recently built new farms with identical modern houses. They were able to populate these houses with chicks from single uh, breeder flocks. So his boss said, please test this additive in, this, in these two houses. But he disagreed because he had statistical knowledge. He just graduated. But his manager insisted. So what he did, two months later, went back to his manager. And he, um, he showed him the results. He said, there's four points difference between the two treatments. Uh, sorry, between the two houses. And his manager said, you see, you were not convinced it was work, right? You weren't convinced, and now you see, it works, we have four point difference. And then he told his manager, but I didn't do the study. I gave them both the same feet. So this was a great way for him to, 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 to demonstrate that these studies don't make sense. So, comparing lab studies versus field uh, studies uh, now, um, these laboratory studies, like they're in, in a research farm or university uh, environment, they are, are, they are controlled experiments and um, they, are, they are potentially lacking the challenges that a field, uh, that a broiler would experience in the field, but by the fact that they are often uh, managed by very skilled technicians, that have ex that uh, the reduction, the, the variation is a lot lower, even when you compare pens to full houses with 30,000 broilers. This allows for more rep more treatments within a study so you can do fundamental research or do or test different test ingredients do screening on them however um, it depends a little bit on the country but laboratory studies are really subject to in, uh, increasing regulatory control which is often uh, less the case in in, in commercial house uh, trials um, so, they clearly have bo both have pros and cons. Um, there, is an, there is this merger of the two. Uh, if, you are go if you would, uh, and it's, it's a practice that is increasingly done, uh, it was also reported at the PSA uh, in, uh, in, the U in North America and the USA. It's actually supported and facilitated by DSM there. They have commercial pen studies. So they place these kind of pens inside commercial houses. Uh, they'll typically use 24 of them, test two treatments, and um, uh, go in with experienced technicians to do the weighing, and uh, the weighing of the feed, the weighing of the animals, do statistical analysis, and that's where um, data can be, uh, is, is being uh, obtained that is yeah under the relevant challenge conditions that are not necessarily defined but at least they are relevant for that producer so that can be a, a great merge of these two things to, to design so before i talk about um, the size of an experiment i want to quickly review with you different the different outcomes of an experiment Experimental design is about knowing the likelihood of obtaining a false positive result, so which is often referred to as a type 1 error. It relates with the p-value that you see in papers. So in scientific papers, we often want 95% certainty. So that's the p should be lower than, the uncertainty should be lower than 5%. I believe that in the industry, we make a lot of decisions with a lot lower certainty. And for good reasons, perhaps, you know. Um, there's a lot of decisions that are being made that, and we don't have any 
good re uh, uh, estimation of the certainty. Luckily, in science, in research, when, you have, when you're doing research, you have some numbers and you can do statistics and you can look at certainty percentages. And they don't have to be 95%. But I encourage all of you, those that design studies at least, to have that conversation in the early phases, say, how certain do we need to be? Or are we going to do one study in a controlled experiment and later on we're going to do some field studying or we do two studies? So maybe we don't need 95% certainty in, 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 in each of these studies. Maybe 80 is enough or, 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 or even less because it will greatly impact the, the possibilities to do research. But having the conversation early on is very valuable because you might be doing studies that do not make any sense. So that's about the type 1 error. Then there is the possibility of false negative results. Um, and that relates with what is often called, what is called the power of experiment. Can we detect the difference that we would like to detect? So I think it's a very common problem to have tr experiments that are lacking that power to detect the difference that we want to detect. But do remember, um, a trial, an experiment might not be able to, it's, it is the power, the power, no, the power is related to a certain uh, differences that you would like to detect. Yeah? There might still be differences there that truly exist that are smaller, but you are typically not going to find that too relevant because they are so small that it, it doesn't um, pay off. So then there are, of course, these two other correct decisions. Yeah? Um, these are um, the desired outcomes of a study. You want to be um, you want to be sure about what you're finding. So, um, the variation between experimental units is really very important to the to the, uh, in determining the size of an experiment. Here I took a sample of various studies, most of them published in poultry science. Um, the big chunk of them um, on the left are uh, floor pen studies. Yeah. The red dots are, is, is coming from data from commercial pens and the dots on the far right on the logarithmic scale are uh, commercial house field studies. So you see that it's just a sample, but you see that irrespective of the, of the type of study, you can find um, um, studies, examples with a high variation, so the upper range and a low variation, the lower range. And this variation, expressed here in standard deviation, is twice as high in the upper as in the lower curve. And this is the, the, these are the corresponding density curves. And you'll see that if variation is high, so which, which occurs in many studies, you can easily have um, more, more than 20 points difference within the same study population. So how does this translate into the, the, the required sample size, the required size of an, uh, of an experiment? Here we have these two same distributions in the right top. And if I use these with this, with this simple equation to calculate uh, the number of um, replications, uh, you will see that looking at the black bars, that if that variation is that high, you're going to need a considerable amount of replications to detect the, the, the two to three points that we typically target in broiler production. But now if you half, if the standard deviation is half of that, which is the corresponds with the, the blue, blue dots, the number of uh, samples that you need is, is reduced by four, by factor four. So if you are in a, in, in, a, in a research facility, if you're able to reduce standard deviation from, from the white black curve to the smaller one, you can do four times more treatments in a single study. Or you can answer four times the number of research questions in a single, uh, sorry, or you can, well, now, now, now I forgot what I said first, but um, 
you, you can do, you have four times more capacity to do research, let's put it in that way. The, now I'm introducing signal versus noise. So these are two scenarios. Um, the signal here is in the same font size. So we're, we're looking at these, these are parallels to these two dense, um, density distribution that I showed. So if, if the signal, the signal can be equally large, but if there is a lot of noise, like variation coming from unidentified or identified sources, we might conclude from a study that there is no statistical effect. The, 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 you have to think here about a professor who is trying to talk to his students. But there is a radio playing. The radio is the noise. So there's two things he can do. He can speak louder then the effect, then he might still come across, or he can uh, um, turn off the radio, right? So, connecting it to the distributions, here there's two um, examples where the signal is identical. The difference between the, the, the mean values in this graph at the top and the bottom one is exactly the same. But by only looking at the curves, you can already imagine that it's going to be far more difficult to demonstrate that effect, that signal, in the second one than in the first one. So replication is, of course, a, sol a possible solution here. If you cannot reduce that variation, you can simply do more replication. Here at the top example, we have uh, three replicates. Yeah? And um, th it gives us a certain accuracy in estimating the mean. When we go to more replicates, the standard error of the mean goes down and we are more accurate in estimating the mean of the two populations. So, in integration data, the data that comes, that, that, that are, is being collected in modern uh, uh, poultry production can be very useful when you do a field study to design it properly. So, there is variation between feed mills and between batches within a feed mill. There is variation between farms. There is variation between houses on a farm or between different cycles within a house. There's, different, there's di variation coming from the breeder flocks. These variations all add up and they could result in something like this. This is from a published paper on a commercial study. A lot of variation in every daily, in every in daily weight gain, comparing it with a well-controlled, uh, uh, controlled environment, right? So by knowing these, the sources of the variation, you can you can consider that in your experimental design when doing a field study. So I want to give four examples. Closing off with I'll close off with four examples of field studies. So, um, this is the most simple one. You can, you have a lot of houses in the in farms, and you're randomly allocating treatments to these houses. Yeah, there's a there is no noisy fact. No variables are taking into account like farms or, or or feed mill. So you're not reducing the variability. You might hear this is uh, based on data from from a from a published paper as well. The same from the previous slide, I did the calculations and to detect four grams of daily weight gain difference, which is quite an effect, you need 40 broiler houses per treatment. So, the next examples are, the, the numbers in the next examples are directional, yeah, because I didn't have insight into, into all these different uh, sources of variation from this, but it's just to give you a feeling that um, if you start to um, block the, uh, uh, commercial houses that are more similar, group them together and allocate treatments within each of these groups, you are correcting for farm and house effects. You're reducing the variation and um, you, can, uh, you can do it less. Then, I can go one step further, I can do a matching. So I'm looking for farms, houses within a farm, and I'm 
I, I use my historical data to know which one have typically the same kind of result. And now um, the difference between each of these pairs of houses that they historically have had is the data that you're, you can use to estimate sample size here. You're now correcting for farm, for cycle effects, and for house. And you, you might be able to reduce your, your sample size further and, and have a statistical power, sufficient statistical power with only 10. They're, the numbers are not real, but you know, directionally, I believe them to be correct. So I want, didn't want to have to uh, discourage anyone to do field studies. I, I, I just want to share some thoughts about how they could be done uh, in, a, in a good way. So a couple of take-home messages then. I believe randomization and replication are key elements of an animal experiments. And randomization is, sounds very easy to do. I think it is rather easy under controlled experiment conditions, but in the field, wow, there's a lot of forces that might uh, unintentionally, um, yeah, uh, influence this, right? Um, I think I, it is very important to determine the, the appropriate size of an experiment beforehand, particularly in those instances where we are trying to detect to or, or proof, but that's actually not a good word, prove the absence of difference. Because if you want to show that things, result, treatments are resulting in the same uh, level of performance, that's where your statistical power is really, really important. It has to be good, it has to be high, otherwise you're draw, taking the wrong conclusion. So for different research objectives, you need different designs. If it is ingredient testing, uh, te uh, screening versus validation study and knowing if, you're, if, you're, if, if an additive or whatever other intervention is working under your specific conditions, you need to do these under, other, uh, under different uh, circumstances. And, and I believe that in many cases the information to do good field studies is available, but you need to start using it and, um, uh, and uh, become smarter in... Um, in field studies design. Thank you all very much.